Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. So is there a time where it's too early to refer these patients where the development of malocclusion will improve? Uh, Kim, that's a good question. You want to refer them as soon as you see that there may be a problem, and we don't always unfortunately have an outcome where the malocclusion improves even though we do the extraction. So you have to let the owners know, hey, we've got pain and or discomfort. We've got interlock, uh, which we talked about in this case, and we've also got the malocclusion itself that we want to try to allow all possibilities of the patient's genetics to get to where the jaw length is normal in relation to uh, the, the upper jaw in our, in our instance here <clears throat> of this, this particular case of the class 2 malocclusion. So it's really never too early if you see that there's a problem. Uh, but again, the, you have to let the owners know we're going to we're going to resolve the problem with the baby teeth. We're going to have to really watch those adult teeth, and you you're going to have to go back. Again, if you, if this is a referral, you're going to have to go back to them. They're going to recommend rechecks, so it's best for them to make those decisions and make those calls and be able to do the best that we can to ensure that the malocclusion has all chances to resolve uh, even though it may not we may have to do other things to the adult teeth. Amy, do you ever treat the lesion made by the mandibular canine if it's severe? So good question and so, uh, this, this, is, this is more for the adult tooth versus the baby tooth. Uh, if there's debris in there with baby or adult, you want to just clean that out really well. Um, you might want to use your periodontal curette or your diamond football burn and gently remove any inflamed gingiva. Um, but if you've got a class 2 malocclusion, we do at times deepen those, uh, make them deeper because we do a different approach. Breed predispositions uh, to root convergence, this uh, Allison Marie uh, asked that question, or I'm sorry, uh, Amy Sneed again asked that question, and then uh, Allison Marie, small, uh, small breed and toy dogs more predisp predisposed. I don't think there's any studies that have been done on this, but just in our experience, small breed dogs are more commonly affected, and they're more severely affected if they are left where this goes undetected, which is very easy to do because there's not a lot of changes that occur on the crown until it's pretty involved in most cases. Sometimes there is, but <clears throat> many times there's, there's not. So uh, the, pro the problem with these is that small breed dogs, the smaller you get, the closer those apices are to the ventral cortex. So if you start to lose bone, then you'll recognize that we can get jaw fracture from these and that has happened on occasion where you get spontaneous fracture and lo and behold it's because of of that exact thing. So um, 
small breed dogs would be the answer to that in my experience. Uh, it can occur in any any patient, but uh, the small breeds tend to have more of a problem with that. As a question for uh, your radiographs, do you use a stationary or handheld unit? This is what we use, Cindy. This is a cocoon. It's like the Nomad. It's a it's a it's like a, a, a handheld one hand handheld unit. And once you turn that thing on, you don't have to touch the top of it again. <clears throat> you just use that trigger, and it's just one one shot. With the with the Nomad. Uh, you have to engage it, so one click on the trigger and then another click. It's much heavier, it's more expensive, so this has replaced the Nomad in our hands and they, they've got a brand new one that just came out that has a crosshair uh, that lets you actually point it right at the sensor. It, this, is, this is by far superior uh, in all respects and in the past the other handhelds have had problems with batteries battery goes out and it's super expensive these are rechargeable and you get nine hours of continual battery use with these and um, nobody's going to use nine hours continually i don't think we use these in the lab and we're taking x-rays all day in those labs and we don't ever run out of battery on these so they're super good and as far as battery goes, and you just, once you're done with them for the day, just put them on their little table stand and let them charge overnight, and you're good to go. You just pick it up, turn it on, and it actually talks to you too. So no space on the floor, no space from the ceiling, as long as your state accepts this. And I think there are only three states that don't, uh, exclusively in our labs, exclusively in our practice. And the Nomad just kind of sits there because it's so daggum heavy, uh, we don't use it anymore. So uh, this is, and we're the only ones that distribute this. Uh, these are, uh, this is veterinary only. Uh, we're the only ones that, that sell this. So you get that on our website and it's uh, super, super efficient as well. You won't find anything quicker. Uh, by the time you change that sensor, or start to change that sensor, this thing's ready to take the next shot. So it's all dependent on where, how quickly that sensor goes to the next spot as to how quickly you do full mouth radiographs. And I and Annie uh, can do a full mouth series in a small dog or cat in three minutes. <clears throat> We've been doing it for a long time, but there's no reason why uh, your techs can't do a full mouth dog or cat uh, in, in eight minutes or less with this. Um, with, a, with a little practice and with a little guidance and, and you can get that, let your tech see that and that will get you to the point where you're, you're using this and using it consistently. And it's super, super fast, super incredible. So uh, this will change your practice dynamics for sure. Carol, will most or all root convergences ultimately need extractions? Many, uh, many of those that are that second molar that are kind of fused will not. Probably most, more often than not they will, but all first molars for sure. If they have root convergence, and even, even the one where there were, the roots were more parallel versus diverge, divergence is the actual normal. So even if they're parallel, if they've got that little defect at the furcation for sure, those are immediate extractions. There's no question on that. If they're not immediate, based on your assessment, then you need to come back and you need to look at those radiographically and monitor those. Uh, root convergence, this took uh, dens and dente. We talked about that. They can have both. Uh, that's not a classic example, but uh, it does have some components of a tooth within a tooth there right at the furcation uh, with that density. But um, you'll see some better examples. Just Google do dens and dente dogs, and you'll see some pretty crazy configurations of teeth if you're interested in, in going down that route. So Eric, are teeth with root convergence much more likely to cause weakness in the mandible uh, while extracting? And yes, they can, uh, especially if they're like that one uh, case that we saw where there was an actual hole in the mandible, and the closer they get, to the closer they get uh, where, the, where that tip gets to the ventral cortex of the mandible, where that root tip's that close or closer, um, then you have more of a chance of causing problems. 
So, Allison Marie, could you discuss closure for a simple excisor extraction? I struggle with friable gingival tissue during these extractions and have time, hard time closing. So, yeah, good question, Allison. If you're extracting a single incisor, a simple incisor, and there's inflammation from periodontal disease, it's not just a fracture, it's the inflammation, you really don't have to do anything other than maybe place a suture in that friable tissue or leave it. Just leave a blood clot there. There's no reason to have to close that. If you extract all of them, then you want to clean up the margins and put some sutures in, clean out the bone. For um, simple extraction, one extraction, a couple extractions in the upper and lower or two in each, no reason to worry about it. Just leave a blood clot in there and that blood clot will uh, form bone within four to six weeks and within a, several days you'll have gingiva migrating over, starting to migrate over and, and close that. You'll never be able to tell it in, in uh, four to six weeks. Amelia Jane, when you do uh, indications for triangular rectangular gingival flaps on molars, premolars, or do you always prefer envelope flaps? So we want to do an envelope flap wherever we can. We commonly do vertical releasing incisions, mesial to the canine tooth, mesial to the fourth premolar, mesial to the first molar in the maxilla. We don't do releasing incisions in the mandible and we don't recommend that. We don't teach that in our labs. You can certainly get by doing a canine tooth without doing a vertical releasing incision and there's a whole that those are the indications. Mesial canine releasing, vertical releasing, and then envelope back to the third premolar in the maxilla, vertical releasing incision on the first molar, vertical releasing incision on the fourth premolar, and then on the fourth premolar you do just the envelope and just bring it up over the mesial root on the first molar and then uh, this, the, or on, and then on the first molar, uh, that's a whole nother ball game. So all those things, a quick, quick question a quick answer to a question that requires a course. Uh, we go over each tooth uh, individually in the simple and surgical extraction course, which is seven hours. So you can imagine we can't do justice to that. And if you take any of our wet labs, you get a uh, exposure to all those procedures before you actually come to the wet lab, in addition to five hours of lecture that we normally or that we used to do during the two-hour weekend wet lab. Now we give that to you all ahead of time, and you have all that. You have to go through that. You have to take a quiz, and then when you show up on Saturday, it's all hands-on. Nerve blocks, periodontal care with curettes, and flaps on day one. Then day two is nothing but canine and feline extraction. So that's where you really get the training, and if you're just getting your first exposure to this, with this workshop in any amount of case management for dentistry, it's an excellent start, excellent way to get exposed to all this information, but it is just a start. This is a, uh, a process of learning throughout your practice life, and you can get good in a, in a year but you're going to get better as you go if you have the right training. If you don't have the right training, it's just like anything else. You can go out there and hit, hit and uh, play golf and hit balls all you want. If you're not doing the right thing, you're, you're not making any progress at all. Same thing with practicing anything, violin, piano, any instrument, any sport. Uh, it's, it's continued practice doing the right thing. It's not 10,000 hours of practice. It's 10,000 hours of deliberate, correct practice to be an expert in anything. And I'm not saying you need that many hours in dentistry, but just an example, it's got to be the right type of practice or you're going to be spinning your wheels for the rest of your practice life. So we're here, we're here not to sell things, sell courses, sell uh, our services. We're here to get you where you need to be. And if I didn't tell you about this stuff, I would be doing you a big disservice and not allowing you the resources that you can invest in to get to the point where you can actually help more patients better over your practice lifetime. So 
my purpose is to get the general practitioner where they need to be in dentistry overall to be the best they can be and if that moniker selling has to be attached to that I'm perfectly fine with that but things like this where we can do that are really inexpensive to get you started and get you on the right track this is where it all starts so take that as you will and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see you at some point in uh, in the programs that we offer I hope you enjoyed that episode if you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.